Welcome to part two. We are going to discuss the nomination game and this really takes place from the convention standpoint and then I'll walk you briefly through to election day on January 20th. I'll also talk about some campaign strategies that are involved as well. On this portion, the convention send off for the primary season. One moment, let me get my pen working. The primary season is held January to June, just so you have a timeline. And then in the summer, they usually uh, refocus a little bit, come up with a general strategy, choose their vice presidential running mate. And in August, they have the convention. And the national convention is very much like a pep rally or send off for the candidates. Two key things that a national convention will do. It is held every four years by the major parties, so Republicans have one and Democrats one. They choose a presidential and vice presidential candidate, and they write the party platform. We have mentioned all these things before, but it's a good review always to go back over the purpose of a convention. After the last day, uh, which is the keynote speech, there's convention send-off, and that signals the start of the general campaign where the candidates try to appeal to every single voter in America. It once provided great drama, but now they are more of a formality, which means at the convention uh, they don't get as much TV time as they used to, but it still provides a little uh, bit of fun if you're into politics and listening to the speeches and the rallies. They're still important to the party for organization and motivation of the party base. The convention is really for party activists who love their candidates, they want to influence uh, what is happening and the delegates that attend and the super delegates who are elected officials also get that vote. They write the party platform, which is a statement of the goals and beliefs of the party. And we had mentioned earlier as well, each issue in the party platform equals what we call a plank. So health care, foreign policy, the economy, all those are planks that the candidate stands on. So the party platform is the general statement of beliefs, and it makes the candidate very, very happy. Official nominations of candidates and speeches take place. And this is one thing. This is the declining coverage of conventions on network TV. Network would be ABC, NBC, CBS. They rarely, they used to give uh, almost every single night full coverage of convention happenings and now really they just cut into several major nights. You can see in 1956 tons of coverage and now we're pretty much down to about an 8 to 10 time slot several nights of the convention to see the keynote speakers. This is a little graphic of what happens and I showed you this the very first day of the unit but in November this is the big day on election day people will go vote for their person uh, who they want to be president. And remember, when a person votes for a president, they're really voting for a slate of electors who represent that candidate. Once the people have voted in the Electoral College, the famous number is 538. And how you get that number, there are 435 in the House, 100 in the Senate, and three in the District of Columbia, which equals 538. And a candidate needs the magic number of 270. If you divide 538 by two, it equals 270. Each state is awarded a number of electors based on the population of that state. So Missouri, this was before the 2010 census, Every state has two senators, so Missouri had two votes, and we had nine representatives. So Missouri has 11 of the 538 electoral votes. What a candidate will try to do is go for those states 
and campaign heavily in states that they think they can win that will add up to that magic 270. And a candidate really can achieve that in a very tiny amount of states. So as you go through here, again, this is pre-2010 before the census changed. Missouri has actually lost a vote. We are now down to 10 because uh, we lost a member in the House of Representatives. But the magic number is still 270. So what happens is on Election Day we vote, and then in December the electors cast their electoral vote, and they send them to the Senate to open in January. In January, the official vote, and I'll go over this in more detail in the next presentation, but in January, uh, they vote, and then on Inauguration Day, the president is sworn in. Whatever candidate gets 270, uh, they are sworn in on January 20th, and that is the 20th Amendment. The 20th Amendment moved the inaugural date from March 4th to January 20th. And this is nicknamed the Lame Duck Amendment because the president finds out if he wins or loses in November. And they basically are sitting in office November, December, January, February, March as we saw in the court case Marbury versus Madison when John Adams tried to pack the court with Federalist judges they realized five months as a president who has lost his power and is going out is too long so they moved the transition time up several months and since the 20th amendment we have uh, sworn in our president on January 20th every four years Some strategies involved in this, you know from just studying what we've looked at, it is a very high-tech media campaign. Normally you will see a lot of mail used to generate support, but with the advent of social media, you see a much greater push through internet emails uh, to save money. To get media attention is a wonderful idea if a news agency can visit somebody visiting a nursing home or marching in a parade their ad budget is basically free coverage and that's really what candidates are trying to do is save money and get photo ops they emphasis marketing a candidate it's very important to create the person that they want to be seen as and so they work very hard to go door to door to meet people they call that canvassing neighborhood, neighborhoods to get the vote, and that's one thing that they do. The news focuses on strategies and events, not necessarily policies. I think most of us could say that President Clinton and President Obama and President Bush, uh, we know what they do, but sometimes we don't know what they believe. So, for example, President Obama is going on a nationwide tour visiting factories and they showed him on TV tonight with um, a lot of people around him just visiting and giving speeches. But the news really didn't focus on what he was advocating. It just focused that he was going on a campaign about the economy, not a lot of specifics. Organizing the campaign is an incredible task for any candidate. They need a campaign manager who will be a strategist. They need a ton of volunteers to help run the campaign, stuff envelopes, answer the phones. They need somebody to help them fundraise. I heard a statistic one time that the average congressman in the House, a race can cost two to three million dollars, so they have to fundraise anywhere from a thousand dollars, and that could come in small donations up to three thousand dollars a day uh, in order to or at least a week in order to keep that money in the coffers. They have to assemble a staff, plan the logistics. In different cities, they have to have offices and campaign headquarters. They must get a research staff, policy advisors. They need to hire a pollster in order to gauge public opinion. They need a spokesperson, so normally a press secretary. They need uh, people and volunteers to help establish a website and have a really good media presence on uh, online. 
Campaigns basically have three effects on voters. Really, campaigns are out there to reinforce the base, to hammer home what we believe in in the Democratic platform or the Republican platform. They are there to activate people, to um, get involved in government and get involved with campaigns. And they're there for the conversion of voters. They want independent votes to be swayed to their side. And that's really the three main things that a candidate is trying to do. Mostly, though, they reinforce and activate their base. The base, when I say that, are the groups of people who already enjoy uh, the party platform and the candidates um, that they have year after year. Uh, most people are very loyal. Selective perception is um, paying attention to things and agreeing with things and that's what most people do you pay attention to what you want to pay attention to and you agree to things that you want to hear sometimes you don't listen to the whole picture but you just want to pick things out that you agree with and many people focus on those things party identification still has an effect on voting if people do not know who to vote for then they fall back on party ID this has taken a hit and has declined a little bit recently. Party ID has declined because independent voters have increased. And with the gridlock and fighting in Congress, I think you can understand why some people say they don't want to have any party. They'd rather vote independent. So party identification uh, has had uh, an impact on voting. Incumbents start with a substantial average, um, advantage. I want you to note these two things. The AP test loves these two questions. An incumbent we have defined before as a current office holder. So Jay Nixon is our current governor, and therefore he is an incumbent. Pat Conway is an incumbent to the Missouri legislature. Uh, Sam Graves is the incumbent in the 6th District House. An incumbent starts with a substantial average. About 90% of incumbents are re-elected, and that is a huge percentage. They have the advantage of franking, and franking equals free mail. If you're already a congressman, you get free mail. They have the advantage of already uh, being in front of their constituents, so if they visit, sometimes they get free TV time. A little difference between presidential and congressional campaigns. If you recall, congressional campaigns run on every even year, so therefore they are held every two years, and the next congressional 14. A presidential race, of course, is held every four years, and the next one is 2016. Both of these together are called federal elections because we are electing federal office holders. Presidential races are much more competitive. Incumbents have an advantage. Fewer people vote in congressional elections because it's considered, um, it's just presidential elections have the most voters. Congressional incumbents have local power and can mobilize their base and presidents have national. And congressional candidates can often duck responsibility. They can ride on the po president's popularities and they can also say, I had nothing to do with it. The power of presidential coattails is very important. If a president is popular, more than likely the candidate will be popular. And that's called writing the coattails. If President Obama is a Democrat, then the Democrats will have the advantage normally in an election. I think you can read over these last few ones, understanding nominations and campaigns. If you have any questions over that slide, I can go over it with you. But these are just some little things we talked about in the media. Remember, paid advertising, our spots. We have learned uh, overwhelmingly negative ads tend to influence voters more. News broadcasts are often called visuals. Uh, candidates rely on free advertising through the TV and the media. For photo ops, credibility with voters, relying on constant media coverage. Remember, the debates are very important, too. 
the first televised debate was Nixon versus Kennedy. People on the radio thought Nixon had won, and people watching the TV saw a very uh, relaxed Kennedy and a very nervous Nixon because he was sick. And what people sometimes watch for is, is somebody going to mess up or slip up. Uh, computers and Internet have decreased uh, direct mail campaigns and uh, really helped, I'm sorry, this says computer has increased direct mail campaigns, although mailing has really uh, not been one of the major things. We still get things in the mail from our congressmen, but they also rely on people going to their websites as well. So let's review again real quick. Selecting a president. The nominating convention, you have the presidential selection, which is the caucus and primary. The nominating convention, then you have the general election and the electoral college. These next few slides just go through some of the clarification that we've already talked about. So if you want to spend time going through those, these are some examples of different platform themes, what a delegate is. This one right here in delegate selection, the proportional and winner take all, those are different things. We associate that also with the electoral system. Delegates versus superdelegates. Superdelegates are elected officials. And this is just a slide of how close it really was to see who was going to get the Democratic nomination you needed 2026 to win. And you see here Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were neck and neck. So the, the Democratic Convention in 2008 was quite exciting to watch. Again, the reason I did these slides, I just thought you might want to see a little bit different tone and some of the original pictures. And if you read through these slides, I think it makes it pretty um, understandable. And again, political cartoons I just thought you would enjoy. Okay, so that ends this part. I hope you understand campaigns and elections a little better. And I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording.